Okay, last time we saw that the Lorentz transformation. So we said that let have a frame K and another frame K prime moving with respect to the K. Let's say that along x1 in one dimension. So beta is v over c. So in k frame, you have coordinates, time, and space. In k prime frame, you have coordinates, time prime, and x prime. So if it is moving along the one dimension, we saw that the time coordinate, so basically x0 is c times t. The time coordinate is c in at the k prime coordinate is gamma uh, x0 minus beta x1 and x1 prime so let's say this is x1 yes x1 prime is gamma x1 minus beta x0 and the other components perpendicular to the relative velocity of the coordinates doesn't affect it And I said that you can call that the beta is a tangent hyperbolic psi, gamma is cosine hyperbolic psi, and gamma beta is sine hyperbolic psi. And you can express this. Lorentz transformation is a x0 prime x0 cosine hyperbolic psi gamma is cosine hyperbolic psi and the other one x1 gamma beta gamma beta is sine hyperbolic psi And x1 prime, x1 prime is gamma uh, times x1. So this is plus x1 cosine hyperbolic, which is this term gamma x1 cosine hyperbolic psi and the other term minus gamma beta x0 so that is minus x0 sine hyperbolic psi so this is a Lorentz transformation and you can write this in a different format so psi is called as a boost parameter or repetitive. So we will define next week a boost matrix and the form of the matrix will be the, in the following form. So cosine hyperbolic psi minus sine hyperbolic psi zero zero minus sine hyperbolic psi cosine hyperbolic psi zero zero and the other components doesn't affect it. So this is called a boost matrix and it is boosted along what? Along uh, psi 
and cosine is nothing but cosine epsilon 1 along x direction x direction so basically if you multiply this uh, coordinate vector you can find that the uh, x0 prime is what so if you multiply this by x0 x1 x2 and x3 so first term will be x0 cosine hyperbolic the other term will be minus sine hyperbolic psi x1 and uh, this will be minus sine hyperbolic x0 this will be uh, x1 prime x1 cosine hyperbolic and this will be what x2 prime is equal to x2 and this will be x2 is equal to x3 x3 is equal to x3 prime so the form is written in your book in three dimension. So I am not able to derive this the boost matrix in three dimensions. I can give you the derivation and put the derivation to the internet or distribute to you. Because it will take, if I derive this, it will take one or two hours extra. So one thing I, I want to mention to you, the, if you have a rotation, if you have a rotation, the situation is the following. Suppose that we, we have four by four boost matrices and we have four coordinates, time, x1, x2, x3. So if you have a rotation in the space, you can use this, but the structure is the following. Suppose that think about the rotation so x y z if you think about the rotation along z axis so let us call the omega is a rotation angle along the z axis let's call this is a epsilon 3 so rotation along the z axis could be defined in the following form. So time coordinate doesn't affect it through this rotation and the others are what? Uh, minus sine hyperbolic psi is replaced uh, sorry minus sine hyperbolic psi will be replaced by uh, sine omega and uh, the rest will be the same. So cosine omega sine omega zero and that is minus and this one so this is plus sorry this one is minus sine omega cosine omega zero and zero zero one so the if you make a rotation along z axis the situation is the following if you have if you multiply this by column vector in four dimension time coordinate will be the same so x0 prime will be x0 and the rest will be what what will be the other one x1 x1 prime will be what? Uh, cosine omega x2 plus so x1 so you will multiply this by basically x0, x1 and this will be cosine theta x and that the other one will be sine omega x2 and x2 prime will be what minus sine omega x1 and the other one will be cosine 
uh, omega x2. So do you remember this formula? This is the rotation along the z-axis. Okay, this is not, these are not hyperbolic function functions. I think I did everything correctly. So you put here the column vector x0, x1, x2, x3. So this is the rotation along the z-axis. And in the rotation, time coordinate doesn't affect it. Since the rotation along the z-axis, z doesn't change. So if you boost, this is Lorentz transformation. You are using the hyperbolic functions. If you look at the similarity, which I told you last time, it is very similar in structure. If you look at the, this piece and that piece, it is similar. Instead of thetas, you have hyperbolic. So if instead of cosine theta and sine theta, you have the hyperbolic functions. But in the case of the boost, you have minus minus here. But in the case of rotation, we have plus minus sine theta. So this is the one of the thing. Rotations doesn't affect the time coordinate. And the rotation is similar to the boost. But in the boost, you have the hyperbolics. And the one sign is different. And that sign is important. It, it, it makes what? c square t square minus x square but here the magnitude of the uh, vector is x square plus y square so we have discussed that the uh, uh, time dilation we have seen that the definitions of the scalar product of four vectors and now we will do application related with the scalar product so basically, you have a, you have the four vector C T X time and space space time coordinates or four vector sorry, and if you define a four vector for a four wave number in the following format, omega over C and wave number. So as you see that we will see that this is related with the energy, this is related with momentum later, not today, next time. If you consider that the scalar product of these two, what is the scalar product of these two? How we can define the scalar product? Do you remember? You are multiplying the time coordinates and we are taking the dot product of this thing with the negative sign. So if you remember that the, if you remember that the definition of the a dot b. What was the a dot b? a0, b0 minus a dot b. Definition of the scalar product in four dimension. And we said that this is invariant in any Lorentz frame. That is nothing but a0 prime, b0 prime minus a0 prime dot B0 prime. So if you look at the scalar product of these two four vectors, what you are going to obtain? You will obtain what? Ct times omega over t, that will be omega t minus k dot x. This is the scalar product of these two vectors. If you go to the other uh, inertial frame, this length will not be changed. But what will be changed? Length, this scalar product is invariant in any uh, Lorentz frame, inertial frame. But if you go a different frame, so frequency will be maybe a different frequency, time will be different, and wave k and x prime are all different. So basically, this is nothing but the in invariance of the uh, invariance of the uh, scalar product. So a dot b is equal to a dot a prime dot b prime. And if you have a one vector is a uh, space and time, if the other vector is the four wave number, 
wave number and the that is related to the, the energy. If you take the scalar product, so multiply the time um, coordinates, then subtract the uh, scalar product of the x and x uh, k. So do you remember what is this? So you are familiar with this. What is this? Hmm? Yes, this is the phase of the wave. So basically if you write in that form, this will be the plane wave or yes, and that is the part of the spherical wave also. So phase of the wave and that tells you that phase of the wave is invariant uh, in all frames. And what does it tell us? This That tells us the following. So using the Lorentz transformations, uh, we can find that the frequency of the wave in different frames. So basically we will end up we, we will end up the relativistic Doppler shift. Relativistic Doppler shift. So this is nothing but the phase of the wave. And let us play uh, these terms and try to find it the frequencies. So first term omega t, what is the k dot x? So in general, in general if you have a k frame and k prime frame, if it is moving with some velocity or beta is v over c, if you have an x vector here uh, and x prime vector there, and if you have a k prime and k, let's say you have the k and k prime, so anything you can think. So you can decompose this k, k parallel to the relative velocity, k perpendicular to the relative velocity, and similarly x parallel to the relative velocity and perpendicular to the relative velocity, you can write that. So that will be the following. So the second term could be written as could be written as k parallel x parallel k perpendicular x perpendicular and the other omega prime t prime could be written as k parallel prime x parallel prime and plus k perpendicular prime x perpendicular prime. You can write in that form. So the other thing, you know that the uh, how we are going to transform these things. So first term multiply by c by divide by c that will be nothing but c times t x0 and c times t prime will be x0 prime. So basically this first term x0 uh, over omega c. So that one will be x0 over omega c. So because x0 is c times t. And similarly, we have the same structure here. Multiply by c, divide by c, and this turns to be x0 prime over c. So one thing we did, so x0 is ct, x0 prime is ct prime. And what other tools we know? We know that the Lorentz transformations of this x0 prime, x parallel prime and perpendicular. So here it is. In one dimension here it is, but if it is any direction, that will be what? x1 will be the x parallel and x2 and x3 will be the x perpendicular. So basically the situation is the following. You can write for x0 prime, you can write for the x0 prime what? 
gamma x0, gamma x0, gamma open parenthesis x0, minus beta x1. So what is beta x1? Beta x1 is nothing but beta x parallel. It's parallel component. So that is equal to beta x parallel. And what we have? We have this one, x parallel prime. What is x parallel prime? x parallel prime will be what? This one will be the parallel component. So gamma x parallel minus beta x0, that will be. So that will be gamma x parallel minus beta x0. How about the perpendicular components to the relative velocity of the frames? Perpendicular components doesn't affect it. So basically the perpendicular component will be the x perpendicular itself. So if you insert these informations, what you are going to obtain? So let us insert this information. Omega over c x0 minus k parallel x parallel minus x perpendicular x perpendicular. Let us try to equate these things right hand side in the coefficients of the x0 and x parallel and x perpendicular. So the easiest term is the x perpendicular. So x perpendicular is times, so if you take the coefficient of x perpendicular, this will be what? k perpendicular prime x perpendicular. Instead of x perpendicular prime, right? x perpendicular. This is the easy one. Then try to collect the things at the coefficients of the x0 and, and uh, x parallel. So x parallel. So let us try to co collect the coefficients in the x0. What we have in the x0? We have omega prime c gamma. And we have what else? Minus minus plus gamma beta. So basically, that will be omega prime over c gamma. That is the one term. What is the other term? Minus minus plus gamma beta. And, and what else? Gamma beta. So, so in the coefficient of the x0, let me tell you again. We have what in the coefficient of x0? We have what? Omega prime over c times gamma from here. Other x0 is here. And that is nothing but gamma beta minus minus plus and x, a k parallel prime. So this should be equal to ga gamma beta k parallel prime. We can control this result. So let me take this to go a little bit away. And let us concentrate on the x parallel component. So take the parenthesis of minus x parallel. If you take this parenthesis, what you will have? You will have what? Uh, beta gamma omega prime over c. Beta gamma omega prime over c. This term. So if you take the x parallel parenthesis, you will have what? Omega prime over c uh, gamma. All of them there. What else you will have? You will have what? Gamma. Uh, k parallel prime. So you will have in the minus parenthesis that will be k parallel prime gamma and the rest. So let us look at whether I did the calculation or correct or wrong. So according to my notes it's okay. So let me look at again x uh, parallel. So we have what we have minus gamma beta omega over 
prime over C and in here uh, we have gamma times K prime. So if you look at the all coefficients, you can easily see that the, their all coefficients should be equal to each other. That tells you that K perpendicular is equal to K perpendicular prime. This is the easiest one. And the other, let us look at the coefficient of the x parallel. So this is the coefficient of the x parallel. So that tells you that k parallel is equal to this whole stuff and that is nothing but the following. k parallel, if you take the gamma parenthesis, that will be equal to gamma k parallel prime plus beta omega prime over C if you take this coefficient. So x parallel and x parallel here and take the gamma parenthesis that will be that. So this is k parallel in terms of k parallel prime. You can take the inverse transformation easily then you can tell, tell that k parallel prime is equal to gamma k parallel beta goes to minus beta omega prime is on prime over c. This is the inverse Lorentz transformation of that you can do. And if you're interested in with the coefficient of the x0, you will have what? Omega over c. So we are coming to the relativistic Doppler shift because we will relate the omega in terms of omega prime or vice versa and we have information about the, how the perpendicular and the uh, parallel components relative to the frame motion of the frames of the wave numbers change, vectorial form of the wave numbers. So if you look at this coefficient, you have what? Uh, omega prime over C gamma and gamma beta K parallel prime. Omega prime over C gamma plus gamma beta K parallel prime. And basically, omega over C is what? Oh, what is the omega over C? K, magnitude of the K. Magnitude of the K. So let me call K0. And omega prime over C prime, K0 prime. If you take the gamma parenthesis, that will be gamma k0 prime plus beta k parallel prime. So omega over c is the magnitude of the k, space part of the k. So basically what I told you in the beginning, I defined that the four wave number is omega over c k and if you look at the length of this vector, what is the length of this vector? Omega over c square minus k square, zero. Omega over c square minus k dot k, k zero, that is zero. So we will replace this later as the energy and momentum and the length of the energy and momentum of the Fourier vector for a photon will be zero. For a massive object that will be a related m square c square. So we will do this next time. So if you do an inverse Lorentz transformation, to this one, you will end up with k0 prime gamma prime will be on prime 
and beta will be minus beta uh, k parallel. So put again the value of the k0, that is nothing but omega prime over c, and this is gamma omega over c. So then write the beta k parallel. Beta k parallel is nothing but the scalar product between the beta and k. And that is nothing but beta magnitude, k magnitude, and the angle between them. So if you do go one more step, this is nothing but omega prime over c, gamma omega over c, uh, beta magnitude, uh, k magnitude. What is the k magnitude? What is the k magnitude? Magnitude of the k? Omega over c, omega over c. And the angle between them, cosine theta. And, and cancel the all 1 over c's. And take the omega parenthesis, and you will find the omega prime is equal to gamma omega 1 minus beta cosine theta. So this is a relativistic Doppler shift formula. So what does it tell? So the interesting part of this, so I am not, I will try to show something from here. Uh, the interesting thing, thing here is the following. So, so let me write this again. So omega prime is gamma omega 1 minus cosine beta. You have both red shift and blue shift there. So omega prime is gamma omega 1 minus beta cosine theta. Which frame is the omega prime frame? is the k prime frame, moving frame. And when this angle is 0, then you have one choice, 1 minus beta, gamma omega. The other ch choice is gamma omega 1 plus beta. So that corresponds to theta equal to 0, and theta is equal to pi. When the frequency is lower, when the frequency is lower, that corresponds to redshift. Wavelength is increased, so that should be redshift. And when the frequency is increased, wavelength is decreased, it is called a blue shift. But you are interestingly seeing another thing. What is the another thing? Even the angle is pi over 2. You have what? A Doppler shift. So if gamma is high, still in 90 degrees, you have a Doppler shift. And that could be seen uh, only uh, spatial theory of relativity. So this is the consequence of the spatial theory of relativity. So Einstein published, I think, this 1907, two years after the uh, relativity paper published this information and but the difficulty is the observing the Doppler shift in pi over 2 because at pi over 2 if one frame and another frame at pi over 2 they are closest distance and the waves more longitudinal hard to observe this so basically I look to Google and And I am going to show you the simulation also. Uh, the experiments are the, one experiment is the atomic uh, 
spectral lines, 1938. The other is the Mesbier effect. But the, the interesting that I find that the other observational effect is the red shift and the blue shifts from the source of the black hole binary. So basically what is done is the following. So you have a companion star and a black hole here and accretion. So to, towards the accreting black hole, there is a relativistic jet. And at those relativistic jets, it's very huge. The relativistic particles ejecting perpendicular to the disk around what? Uh, 0.7 C. And this is processing, this disk is processing at a time scale of 172 days. Okay? So the observer at the Earth sees that the Doppler shift from the emission lines. And sometimes it's red shifted. Sometimes it's blue shifted. So when this is moving, it's processing, sometimes close to the earth, and the velocity of the particles towards the observer, we can see as a, what, uh, from the, our observation point, as a, if the particles coming to us, we can see as a blue shift. And at the 80 days later, the structure is like this. The, this stream goes away from us and we can see as a redshift. So basically doing a lot of statistic of the laps of observations of the 162 days, you can have several redshift and blue shift data. But what you have to do, so it should oscillate between red and blue, but the mean value should be something not zero. If you look at the upper and lower, the mean value will be gamma omega. So this is observed for a source name is a SS433. And from that source, it is conclu they conclude that the main effect is the, uh, due to the uh, relativistic Doppler shift. And even the angle is 90 degree, you have still a uh, Doppler shift. So, so the people who publish this data, I know this, so I find in the Google, and uh, I was a postdoc in 20 years ago, and I worked with the same data, but in top, completely different process. I worked for the, this data, Doppler shift data, to estimate that, that the when is the to estimate that the irregularity of the precession of the disk, but the same data is used to find that the relativistic Doppler shift. So here I can give you uh, the uh, simulation also here it is seen. So when the particle is moves in forward direction, we have more blue shift, and in backward direction, we have red shift, but in the, even in 90 degrees, you can have a, a red shift also. So you, can, so you can pass this to your friends. So this is the case of the SS433. These are blue and red shifts, and this is a simulation of the uh, relativistic particles. So you can, distribute this also from the Google. Now, one, one other thing I want to show you that uh, you can pass the Mac to the, your friends. So the other thing, this is the relativistic Doppler shift and what does it tell us that even in 90 degrees we have still uh, uh, Doppler shift, but this is actually related with the time dilation also. The other thing, you can look at that the, how the light is changed if you have a frame moving in high velocity. Because we know that the k perpendicular and k parallels are transformed differently. So let us inve investigate that the, how the 
light beam change, light beam pro uh, reaching to us is change uh, if we are if we are in the frame of relativistic the moving frame. Now the situation is the following: the, the, the things are easy. So in one frame, you can observe that the photon arrival time directions or whatever some angle theta. But if you go to the other frame, moving frame, that will be theta prime. So the relation is very simple because you know this information. So k perpendicular prime to the k parallel prime is nothing but tangent theta prime seen in the moving frame. So if you look at this ratio, what we are going to find? So k perpendicular doesn't affect it. And k parallel, k parallel prime is here. That is gamma x parallel minus beta k0. What is the k0? This is nothing but k0. Now, if you divide to the k perpendicular, so the algebra is simple. So let me go with quickly. That is equal to gamma, 1 over gamma, k parallel over k perpendicular minus beta k0 over k perpendicular. And this is tangent theta prime. So this is inverse of the tangent theta, cosine theta, sine theta. And k perpendicular is nothing but what is the k perpendicular. So if you divide this as a k, k parallel and k perpendicular, you can get the following. So this should be equal to 1 over gamma k parallel over k perpendicular cosine theta over sine theta uh, minus beta k0. And what is the k perpendicular? k perpendicular is k0 sine theta. So this should be k0 sine theta. k0 will be cancelled, sine theta goes up. And you can end up the tangent theta prime the angle of the beam seen in the moving frame is sine theta over gamma cosine theta minus beta. So, so beam is banded along the direction of the motion if gamma is higher the beam is narrower and narrower. So in the, in the simulation, uh, you are seeing that there, if the wave is, if the observer is moving at high speeds, in the forward direction, you have low frequency that is blue, but in behind, you have more higher frequencies and in the top, again, it is higher, but the all of them is banded by an angle theta prime. So that is all for the uh, relativistic Doppler shift. So the next thing I am going to do, uh, addition of velocities, but we have only uh, 10 minutes. I am skipping the addition of velocities to the next time, and we will also talk about the, the energy and momentum of the relativistic uh, particles. Then we will look at the 
some uh, simple properties of the Lorentz transformations, which are the covariant and the contravariant transformations. We will define that the uh, metric tensor also. So that's all for today.